Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. This is part two of our interview with independent watchmaker Christian Lass. If you haven't yet listened to the first part, I recommend going back and downloading it. It's episode 72 of Off Hours, and uh, catch up with that before you get into this episode. If you're interested in following more of Christian's work, you can find him on Instagram at Christian underscore Lass. You can also find his watchmaking courses at learnwatchmaking.com, and you can find more about his independent watchmaking at christianlass.dk or christianlass.com. Now, with respect to CNC machining, was Vianney's workshop the, the first workshop where you were exposed to CNC machining for watchmaking, or were you exposed to it prior to that? Uh, prior was uh, manual machines. Uh, when I worked with Søren Anderson, it was uh, like uh, manual uh, milling machines. We had some pieces made outside some supplier to make pieces by CNC, but it was very, very limited. That was all, all by, by, by hand in his uh, workshop or by like manual machines. In uh, Vianney's workshop, uh, that was the first time I was really exposed to, to CNC work uh, with his machine. Because I had seen it, uh, I met Vianney before I finished my my education. So in in two thousand, I finished in six, and I, in two thousand four, I I met him in one of these academy meetings, and and I I saw at that time that if you want to make watches, you you kind of have to have a CNC machine as well. So I I built actually in these two years like a CNC machine uh, my, myself. That's the one you see and uh, that I still use today. And so, so therefore, I was exposed to it just by learning it my, myself. And then later in uh, Vianney's workshop, I was exposed to how actually, because in the beginning, I couldn't make these uh, miniature components, that there's a lot of uh, knowledge that go in, 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 into that. Uh, because basically, your tools, if, if you don't know how to, to use it and which cooling liquid and which speed and whatever, if, 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 you're, if you buy one of these, you know, like a 0.2 or 0.1 millimeter cutter, it will just break for you immediately when 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 it, when it touched them the, the, the material. So if if you don't have all the parametrics uh, correct, it it will not uh, cut like not not very not for for very long. And uh, and these tools, you know, they they, they easily cost cost like hundred dollars for uh, for for a tiny tool. Yeah. And uh, if it only it gets like a really expensive parts if you need like four or five of them to 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 get around. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some very expensive days in the shop where I've broken a number of very tiny cutters and by the you know by the end of the day it was it's cost me hundreds of dollars in broken parts so broken tools i, I so i understand what you're what you're saying there yep i i, I had a problem with one of i had to do some uh, micro drilling where i have like a 0.4 millimeter drill i have to drill through the main plate that is uh that is two and a half millimeter thick so it's a very deep hole and yeah. I, for, for for some 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 reason it, it, it drill in the beginning perfect and and, and and then after a while, I couldn't tell why it, it just broke in, in, in inside the hole, until I, I figured out or I didn't figure it out. I just took the manual for for the drill and actually read what what it says, and and then everything was explained how I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that the that that I actually was uh, going with too much RPM, so 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 the, ah. so the tip of the drill was getting hot and expanded, and then it was trapped right. in, in, inside the hole and it broke. And, and and as soon as I just regulated uh, like the speed a tiny bit down, it just made like hundreds of holes with with, with no no problem. It, micro machining is challenging, and and you really have to understand the principles of machining to to do it well. Exactly. Uh, expansion of metals through heat, expansion of tools through heat, rubbing instead of cutting, all of those things they they really you know they really become a problem when you're dealing with such small work. Exactly. It's, it's especially like the the rubbing versus cutting because in yeah. uh, in the beginning you just think okay you just have to have like as much RPM as it can take and then like very very, <laughs> very little feed rate and then it just goes very slowly through the material and you think oh that's that is uh, gonna do my cutter last forever because it doesn't have any chip load at all but they actually do do the opposite that it get dull and 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 break and it's kind of it feels really weird to cut the RPM. By two two thirds, so instead of driving with yeah. sixty thousand, just do 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 twenty thousand, and then put the feed rate to to the double, and think, okay, that's gonna break as soon as it, it touches. But then it just <laughs> cuts through like 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 butter instead. Yeah, an area we've not been able to find much good information on in, in terms of feeds and speeds for watchmaking. 
is for making those tiny threads. Mm. I make most threads by hand, so you can feel it. But if you want to automate that process, having your feeds and speeds dialed in right is really important. And which hole sizes to start with and, and all of that, too. Do you happen to know of any good resources for that sort of information? There's, you have to go to, to the manufacturer that, that makes uh, the, the, the cutters and then ask for, for the table that fits. They normally have like uh, manuals where, where it says if, if you have to make like a 0.5 uh, millimeter fret or something like that, then, then, then you have to drill a hole that is, I don't know, like 0.41 or some, something like, like, like that uh, to, to, to be like optimal. And, uh, and then it's really important also like if you do it by hand, uh, you will often break the cutters because mm-hmm. they seize up in, in the hole. And uh, if you have like a fret cutting machine, uh, the material uh, like kind of cuts so fast that it's it, it doesn't uh, seize up in the hole. And it's actually really, really easy to, to, to make it with, with, with that. I have one of these uh, Ashera uh, fret cutting machines mm-hmm. that I use for, for everything. And it's, uh, it's uh, I, as soon as I get that, I... <laughs> They're wonderful things. Exactly. And, and, and you even have uh, fret cutters that drill first, and then they have the fret cutters and, and, and the same drill bit. Uh, so right. it's, uh, so you should just have to make a point, and then you can, uh, can, can drill and fret in the same operation. It, it is terrifying, though, the first time you take one of those tiny little exactly, end yeah. mills or your tiny little uh, taps and you, you uh, push it into a hole with a, with a machine. That, that, that always terrifies me. <laughs> yeah. So do you know offhand uh, what manufacturers make uh, drill and thread all in one at uh, that sort of scale? Uh, yeah, there's. Oh, um, I just uh, buy them directly from ASCO, A S C O, and that's is, uh, okay. that they can, can can buy them. And but there's many different manufacturers. I don't know if Dixie is doing them. Um, mainly Dixie is the best cutters for CNC and so on. And I'm sure they also make thread cutters, uh, but they're mostly made in uh, tungsten. Right, but but that is also that's like superior. But the only thing is they cannot twist at all because then they break. So you mm-hmm. yeah, yeah you have to keep them to- totally uh, uh, straight. So if you do it by by hand, you will experience that they break immediately. Yeah, but it's true for the first time. Uh, my machine is rated that it can do between zero point three millimeters up, up to a millimeter uh, fret. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I I want to test it one one time, so I put one of these zero uh, point three, and then you know like just by hand it's almost impossible yeah. without breaking them. And uh, and it just like phew, went went through like butter, you know, <laughs> and it just looks totally insane when it does. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, because you 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 just look at this little uh, tap and it's like, oh, I'm gonna put it in. I know we're gonna waste, you know, like uh, thirty or forty dollars, like like in uh, yeah in, in 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 half a second. But I'm gonna do do the do the test. But then it just works like perfect. <laughs> The first silver case that I made, I uh, I broke a, a one millimeter tap in the case because silver is very gummy when mm-hmm. you're trying to thread it. And I, I broke a tap in the case and the, the amount of swearing in the shop that day, because not only <laughs> did you just break your expensive tap, you now have to figure out how to get the, the broken tap out of your expensive case that you've just made. Mm. But you can, uh, what? how do you get it out? Was the acid or was uh erosion or... Um, I was able to get most of it out through, uh, I was able to get it, like sort of grab it with, uh, with ah, okay. some pliers and get most yeah, of yeah. it out. But uh, the the little bit that was left in there, I had to burn out with acid because there was no yeah, other way of getting it. Exactly. It was just too deep in. But yeah, it's it's, it's still frustrating though. So yeah. I, I went away for the day and I, I was finished for the day. I didn't, uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't keep working. <laughs> Yeah, but but that, that that's like that and what's making you probably also have the experience when yeah. you when, when you can just feel in the morning this is gonna be a crappy day, I'm gonna do yeah. <laughs> it's gonna break something or something and, and and then you start and sure enough you just break something and you could just as well uh <laughs> after you've launched a couple of jewels across the workshop because you're you know, you've gripped them too tight or whatever, it's yeah. like okay. <laughs> I'm done it's for not the a day, day for watchmaking. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the difference between a good day and a bad day for a watchmaker can be 0.05 millimeters. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. right. <laughs> so it sounds like it was a bit of a, a trial by fire for you there in the, the early days in Vianney's workshop. Are there any tips or, or techniques or tricks you recall picking up in, in those early days as a, a beginner? I th- think the biggest trick I learned was to shut up and listen. <laughs> that was like... <laughs> 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 After four years in... Uh, in, in, in watchmaking school, you kind of think you're the king of the world. And, and then you start in a place like, like Vianney and you're really, you know, like after the first week, I was, I was 
the it crossed my mind too to go back again you know because it was so hard you know like I've never experienced in anything like 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 that before because as I said you know like in school you you're in thing in most watchmaking schools in the world you don't learn how to produce watches you learn how to to right. to, to repair them to service them yeah yeah it's a service exactly so you can take them apart and put them together without making too much of a mess and it, that is a really uh, but but to to, to 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 be able to do some of uh, these things you know like i think the first product i project i was in was uh helping with the capstone uh watch hmm. uh, which was this great crazy watch with a uh, fusé and a tourbillon and a digital readout, I don't know. But that that was such a crazy project. <laughs> that was, uh, and uh, so so know that, that that there was a lot of tricks, you know, like that. That is mo- most of it, you know, is just general machining. That is that is just like for micro uh, com- com- components. Also, it was a big surprise to me how much labor that goes into producing the the the, the, the parts. That's a that's a huge deal, you know. Like when I was in Vianney's place at that time, I think it was like fifteen employees, and we were doing uh, maybe uh, like I don't know how at these days maybe thirty to fifty watches or something. So it was uh, there was so much time just just like today, you know. Like that's uh, just 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 to, to make a part, it takes so many different steps and operations. It's a never-ending story before you have uh, made made a uh, made a piece. Mm-hmm. Last year, you visited the watch case making museum in Les Monnois. How did that visit impact your approach to case making or, or change your approach to case making? Yeah, um, I mean, I basically found like the the workshop that I have now, I found it in the same city in uh, Normand. Uh, and it was uh, uh, it was an old workshop that's been closed down. And I found it because I spoke with some friends that said, like, oh, maybe you talk with this guy. And I talk with him and he said, like, oh, yeah, I have an uncle in the mountain somewhere. And I came out to this place. And then I also heard that they had this uh, museum of uh, of case making. So uh, so so being up there and make this uh, little podcast about, like, the, the museum, I, I knew most of the processes before because I've seen workshops like this and how, how, how they work. But there was a lot of small details that you that you really first see when you are in a museum like that. So everybody who have like the possibility to to go there is really worth the the, the visit. It's not that far from uh, La, La, La Chaux-de-Fonds. You have to to drive like half an hour from 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 there to to get to the museum. So it's Noirmont where you acquired your your butler yes. case making. Yes, yes, yes. It was like a private place, so it was uh, you know we were standing in the back of a garage uh, under a lot of uh, garbage and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where you find the best tools. Though. Exactly. <laughs> and and I, I know my I have um, I also do engine turning work, and a number of my engines have come from in in places like that where they've been sort of buried under under a bunch of stuff in the back of a shop, and nobody's used it for forty or fifty years, and and so they're. They're just sick of looking at it and they want to get rid of it. So sometimes that's where you find the best tools. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, I did, when you talk about like engine uh, turning, I did find, I don't know, you have to think I was ever on my Instagram, there's like a picture of like restoration work on on our, an engine turning lathe, uh, which was one of these like copying lathe that was used for, for especially for hand engravers that if they have to repeat a pattern, then they made like a master plate and then they could kind of pre-trace mm-hmm. The piece was uh, engraving with these plates, and then they, and, and then the uh, hand engraver could finish it off afterwards. I found one of these in one of these um, uh, what it's called small ads, uh, new uh, what's called uh, websites where people are selling mm-hmm. uh, stuff, and, uh, and 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 it just said like strange rusty lace for for, for sale, <laughs> <laughs> and and there was just this rusty piece, and I just looked at it and said, Jesus man, that's a roast engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like a brocading engine, and those are, they're not easy to find, if, and nobody has any idea what they are. Yeah, exactly. It was brocade engine. So I, I I just called the guy, and and he just, and I, just by coincidence, he, he, he just had it up for five minutes or something like this, and I, <laughs> it was such a luck, and it's just like, I don't care what you do. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm there, like, and you know, like, I'm, I'm just driving from, from, from now on, <laughs> and then, then get it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, th- those over here in North America, that that sort of thing is is very difficult to find here. Yeah. And so yeah, we uh, anytime you know, there's sort of a group of us that are always looking on the you know, on the lookout for those, and we're like vultures. And anytime that sort of thing comes available, it we pounce on it pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. For, for they're food. difficult to find. Yeah. The problem is that the 
that the big uh, companies are getting so much into to Gilloche work that that they also they buy up all all the old machines and uh, and and the prices for, for for the machine. If you have to have a good uh, Roche engine to, to, to today, I mean, you can uh, buy a Ferrari almost for, for the same price. You know? So it's uh, so so it's not uh, something that you do as a hobby anymore as uh, it was before. Yeah. And it's it's very frustrating because companies like Breguet are buying up a lot of these antique Rose engines, but they don't actually use them in their production work. They're they're buying them up in order to to keep them off the market, and they're mm, actually okay, using okay. modern modern engines that they've built, like custom modern uh, Rose engines and whatnot. So it's a, it's a little frustrating for for the smaller guys like me who want to do engine turning work but can't uh, can't get these machines easily. Mm. But I think uh, I don't know how precise they are. But Lind- Lindov is also doing some. I saw them, and I'm I'm, I'm quite yeah. uh, impressed about the work he's doing when I'm following him on Instagram. Yeah, David Lindov's engines. I've uh, I, I've worked with them a bunch of times. He he only lives a four hour drive away, ah, okay. so I've, yeah, I've, yeah. I've been down to visit him a number yeah. of times. I bought a uh, Field Rose engine off of him a number of years ago, and it's a very similar size to the to the engines that he builds. Yeah, and. A lot of the lower end ones that he makes are geared out specifically to do ornamental turning in wood, to ah, okay. live tool yeah. cutting in yeah, wood. Yeah. Uh, but he does also make ones that are are specific for doing uh, guilloche work in metal, hmm. and those they're quite nice. And if uh, you know if, if there's somebody out there looking for a, a rose engine to to work with, and you don't want to go through the hassle of trying to find a, an antique one and then restore it and everything. I can highly recommend getting one of David's uh, engines. They're they're very excellent. Mm. Okay. During your time at Patek and and now too, performing restoration work as an independent watchmaker, you've had the opportunity to work on a number of minute repeaters. So, what are some of the the characteristics that you particularly like or dislike uh, about the approach that certain makers have taken when crafting a minute repeater over the centuries? And if you were to design your your own minute repeater, what are some of the technical choices you think you would make? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because the repeaters they haven't really changed that much o- over the time. Uh, first, of of course, there was like the really really old ones made by Quare, uh, and that is was using this like Stockton system. When you will shift from the quarters from hours to quarters and so on, then the then the levers will lift up and down and then it will change the the, the, the racks like like, like that mm. the the cool uh, one they uh, they did they have like a much more like clever system where where one rack get activated after an, an, another i i mean the the, the, the cool uh, the later ones of up there those ones they in, in my opinion it doesn't get much better than 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 that i mean that works like extremely well the only only problem with minute repeater is that you have so many individual parts that have to function together and ab- absolutely everything have to be like in a super precision and super well regulated otherwise it doesn't work and uh, and 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 that's what also makes like the minute repeater both in the past and also now like extremely expensive because there's so much manual labor in it in in order to, to make it work it's, it's not like you can just machine the parts uh, and then put it in and then it will work it, it doesn't work like, like like that so when when you're working with the uh, with the repeaters get the parts like as raw parts and uh, and then you have to uh, file and polish all the different function all the uh, points where the where there's friction in between to to, to make it work and uh, and and that is like a really like a big uh, like like a big part of uh, of making uh, the, the the repeaters and 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 also restoring them i mean some sometimes i i have restored repeaters where the minute rack for example was was missing and and to mm-hmm. And and to to figure out like the form of it and uh, geometry just from looking at the parts and you know, like that is uh, really mind boggling. Uh, <laughs> you have to do a lot of uh, tests before you have something that that works in the end. But but then then again, as we talked uh, before, you have something like the profile projector where you can go in and measure that that directly in the movement. If you have one with a surface illumination, uh, then, then then you can go in, you put the movement in, and then you take all the co- coordinates of the different pins and levers and all this. Mm. And then you can basically draw the, the the parts from the coordinates in a drawing program, and then make the parts uh, that, that that way. Yeah, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought about using a using a uh, comparator like that. That's a that's a good good uh, good idea. Now, of course, one of the problems with the minute repeater is that even after you have it functioning technically, 
to make it sound good, you also have to have a nice case. So you really, you know, while a lot of people look at a case and they're like, oh, okay, I want to make it look like this and I want to make it pretty. With the minute repeater, you're you're limited because you really want it to sound good as well. So that that's that's a, a quite a challenge too. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and especially in the the old cases, uh, one of the things that make them sound really good is that the the gold is like uh, com- com- compressed, and uh, and they mm. make like a like a band of uh, gold that is like, and and then when they turn it out, it's like compressed, so it's super hard, and then it's like right. super thin afterwards. So so the sound it gets just like uh, the, the case. I always compare it a little bit like uh, with with a, with an instrument. If you take like a violin. For example, then, then then the strings is the movement, but the sound comes from from the case. It's just like the body of the violin that really mm-hmm. uh, produced the sound after it. So the case is extremely Im- important. And uh, another thing that's extremely important is that the um, that the movement, like the tighter fit you have bit between the movement and the case, the better the sound get distributed from the movement to the case. Right. And that is one of the things. So when you work on uh, repeater watches, especially like the the old ones. It's sometimes it's almost impossible to put the movement out because it's really pressure fit in in inside, mm. and uh, and and then also the the, the gongs there the um, the foot what's called like a talon in French there where the the gongs are fixed to to the plate uh, that also have to be extremely well well made. It's normally like mirror polished underneath, and then there's like a middle part taken out, so there's like a small uh, arc in between the two screws. So where the screws are pressing it just pressed by directly on the main plate and it cannot like kind of twist or wrap on, on underneath and therefore the sound get distributed uh, like really well from the gongs and then into the main plate and then from the main plate to the case and then out in, in the world afterwards so they it, it right. have, have like quite a long way the, the, the sound in in order to to get out i i have an old minute repeater watch that uh, an old pocket watch movement that was orphaned from its case uh, the, the case was melted down and and uh, sold for scrap, but uh, I, I've been wanting to make a, a replacement case for it for a number of years, but I, I've been a little terrified of doing it because I know just how, how difficult it is to make a, a case that then allows the, the movement itself to sound good and the, the chimes to sound good. Mm, yeah, it definitely is. It's, it's not so so easy. I mean, I never made any like that that kind of uh, case making work because that is really something else you know like to make like a pocket watch case it's so complicated mm-hmm. i mean the ones who can, can do that that is uh, like an extraordinary uh, task uh, but, but but another thing i've been uh, working a lot with is making uh, like like the gongs uh, to to make those those ones sound nice and that that is also like a like a huge job uh, so uh, when when you make the gongs you basically have first the foot where they are soldered in, into and then you have like a piano wire that you use for for, for making the gong itself. Uh, but when you have made them and and they're not tuned, they will not really produce any kind of now uh, any kind of pleasant sound. They will basically just like like a pink pink pink. They will not sing any like nice big sound out of it. So afterwards, there's a lot of different points that you have to to adjust in, in order to open up the sound first of it. And uh, and then uh, second of all to to tune it so it gets into to, to the right uh, note and, and and all this, so th- there's like a, quite an art and a science to to do that, and that is what really sets apart like the like the sound of the different uh, repeaters that is like 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 the gongs itself, and also the way they're like heat treated. I mean, I only make like the like for the vintage uh, pocket watches, the one who, who taught me who like to 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 do that. There was like, for example, you to harden them, they have to be hardened in uh, salt water uh, because, because normal water will not make them hard enough. So uh, there's like a, a salt water where it's like a, what you call like a complete saturation. I don't know what's called in English. Super saturated solution. Yeah, you, you put as much salt as you can in, into, you cannot uh, dissolve anymore. Then, then afterwards you harden them in a special little uh, jack that holds the spring in place. Otherwise, the gong will bend and wrap around. And when when you have done that, then afterwards they become so hard. I mean, you barely have to look at them. Then 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 they break. I don't know. Like it's really really extremely hard. So so you have you have to temper them up afterwards. And 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 there you can use like uh, different uh, mediums to to do it. Either 
like um, j- just like you do with normal parts you do with uh, if you're tempering a, a a pinion or something you can do it in vaseline oil where you where you like heat it until it burst in, in, in flames but if you really want to do it like the the, the the original version for for doing the, the repeaters you use like the um, like the fat of uh, of uh, sheep that you make like a little pot full of this fat and then you heat it up until it melts and uh, then, then you basically boil it in, in this until it burns also burst into flames and it smells uh, awful when you do it it's like <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have this kind of uh, sheep or <laughs> furry yeah, thing yeah. that just uh, smells awful so your workshop will smell like this for a week after but you have like a nice uh, sound being going yeah. nice now is, is the sound um guided by the the shape of the gong as well as the length or is there like is there a relationship there with the with that curve or is it it's mostly the length that's going to adjust the uh the sound of it i mean there's uh, there's a lot of different things that you do i mean basically like like the pitch like the the height of the tone is the is the length hmm, okay and and then like the sustain of the tone so instead of the same ping is it like bing that is like mm. to um, uh, what's called you modify the attachment points where the gong is attached to to, to the foot, and uh, you you can uh, adjust that uh, down there in various way. Okay. But the biggest challenge is to because you want the gong, the end of the gong have to be steady. You know, if it starts to kick from side to side, it will hit the case and the movement, and uh, right. and 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 that can be uh, quite a uh, challenge. So you basically have to modify it until you get like the right the the, the right uh, waveform inside. That can be really the the, the challenging part. So um, so you put the the gong in in your vice, and then you hit it, and then you file like a tiny bit, and then and then when you file in the right place, you can kind of hear that the sound is opening up. So just like bing 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 bing, and right. then it get like really, really good. And then the the big trick is to stop before it's kind of uh, <laughs> the main shift because there's really you don't want to go too far exactly yeah. there's like a sweet spot where it's really it's it, 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 it's nice so yeah tempering in sheep's fat is is not something I've I've heard of before but it's not surprising when you consider how many of, of these pieces early on were being made on on farms in in the countryside of, of Switzerland a, a similar thing I have heard though for minute repeaters from an older watchmaker is that they used to harden the gongs in horse urine, which makes sense because horse urine would be quite heavily salinated. Yeah. Yeah. But I like the, the sheep's fat. It, it stank when you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Not pleasant. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I also heard that story, but uh, I also heard that it worked just as well with salt water. So <laughs> for, for, for me, it was... Let's stick with the salt water. Yeah, it, it was kind of easier to get a hold of for sheep's fat than horse urine. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John, if we're, if we're going to experiment with this with horse urine, we're doing it at your shop. Yeah. If we're going to use salt water, we'll do it at mine. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any thoughts on on governors for minute repeaters? Yeah, I, I mean, I mostly worked on the older type of uh, governor where you have like this tiny ratchet, like a small escapement. Uh, that's the mm. one you can recognize by make this uh, buzzing sound because I mostly make like the vintage uh, re- repeaters. I also make, of course, some with uh, with the governor inside. Um, of course, like the governor is like a like a better system because you don't have this button uh, like buzzing sound, which can be quite annoying in 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 the old ones. Other than that, that there's not such a big difference between the two. It's it's, it's just like a, a regulator that that regulates the speed. Where one is uh, pretty noisy and the other one is uh, silent. So you've been investing a lot of time over the past number of months crafting a bespoke timepiece for Peter Christensen based on a, a vintage Jean Pergo caliber. And I, I noted in an early render that there was no pin regulator on the the balance cock. But in a more recent image of the balance cock in the metal that you posted, which is beautifully executed, by the way, I see that you've retained the a shields pin regulator on the the balance bridge there. Given that the the balance wheel from that caliber is already equipped with balance screws, have you considered implementing a, a free sprung balance in in this caliber? Yes and and no because uh, both of them have like uh, both the free sprung and and the one with the regulator both have like uh, pros and cons. Uh, I think like the one with the with the regulator was used for a, a, like a reason. Uh, first of all, because it's uh, easier to ad- adjust like the vertical position when you have uh, like a regulator. When when you have a uh, free sprung, 
it's uh, pretty difficult to do anything to the vertical positions uh, where with with the with the regulator there you can regulate like like the distance between the um, the regulating pins and uh, where the, the the hairspring is lying in in the the, the, the regulator uh, so um, from a technical point point of view i really like 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 the like the regulator system uh, the thing with the free sprung is that it looks uh, amazing because it's really like uh, free, uh, like, like 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 that. But we are not like hundred uh, percent determined that if you make like one or the other uh, one yet. I mean, the picture I posted is uh, from one of the first uh, prototypes where we uh, where we have to um, just make it run and then uh, see how it uh, keeps time and 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 all this. So you're using the balance uh, out of the existing yes, movement. Yes, exactly. Okay. For, for the first one you use there, we use the balance out of the existing movement. Then we make a, a different type of a regulator for the balance itself. I haven't posted mm-hmm. anything out of it yet uh, because I want to be finished with the first be- before <laughs> it's kind of, uh, kind of a new system. Uh, right. So I haven't really posted anything about it yet. Now you had talked about, uh, I think in, in your interview with Oster Watches, you had talked about that you may do more than one of these. This isn't just going to be a one-off. Are you are you planning on using existing movements for those as well, or are you planning on building these entirely from scratch? It depends. I mean, I, I can do both, but for making them yep. into some kind of reasonable price, because in the end it's also like a matter of price point. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, because if I have to make uh, like every uh, component uh, here mm. in, 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 in the workshop, uh, then... In the end, it's gonna be like a really, really expensive watch. Yeah. So um, my philosophy of this is of what I do now is to take uh, like really, really high quality components and then build it took together and then make up a product that is like, let's say, like the sum of its part. Right. Just to give an idea, you know, like to to, to make one wheel a pinion and one wheel is like two two days of work plus decoration. So it's easily, I mean, it's close to a week of work just to make sure. make make one one wheel. And if, if you have to do that on a consistent basis, then it's like, or if I have to make like a series of watches, then we'll, then just to make 10 watches, you know, that will take, it will take years to do. Yeah. So from, from that point, I think it doesn't really make much sense for, for that type of type piece that I'm, 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 I'm doing here. I mean, if, if somebody wants it and, and want to pay the price for it, of course, <laughs> I'm happy to do it. <laughs> no, 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 no question about it. Yeah, it's it's always challenging finding somebody who can who's willing to pay for that. So are you you're just making the uh, you're going to make new plates and and bridges and cocks and whatnot for it and yeah exactly and yeah. make them to your design and and decoration and whatnot exactly. So 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 to make uh, like a main main plate where first first of all uh, what what I do uh, that I think is different to many others is that instead of just changing the free bridges on on, on top and make the aesthetics different. I have changed like the main plate because it gives also me like a lot of options to basically to to change. It gives me like total freedom to 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 do. I'm not locked from the position of the wheels and all this. And it, it also allows me to make, uh, for example, I make like a different uh, uh, setting system uh, because the uh, most setting systems that are made like the like in high productions are not exactly very beautiful or aesthetically nice. Uh, right. yeah, because you 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 have the setting lever and set, setting lever spring that is sitting on top as this big plate that is covering everything, it's it's not very very nice. So so I I have designed like like another system that is uh, in, inspired by some of uh, the the work I have seen on older uh, Patek uh, pocket watches and Vacheron uh, models, and then we have in, incorporated that in into that. Some people might say, okay, it doesn't really matter because it's under the dial. Nobody would ever see it, but I know it's there and they collect the yeah. notes there. And that's kind of what, what counts to me. And and future watchmakers will know that it's there as well. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So I, th- I think this of only making that there's a lot of watches that is just as a watchmaker, I, I can say that, that a lot of watches that are really nice on one side. And when you take off the dial, it's, it's a com- com- complete different story. <laughs> so in those setting works, is there a sort of a Geneva seal sort of approach to it where there's no wire springs everything is all the springs themselves are actually made from from steel stock and not from drawn wire yeah ab- ab- absolutely i don't like wire springs mm-hmm. that is kind of a sign of high production and and mm-hmm. like cheap work normally it's like a, 
you you can see it the uh, for, for example the first uh Valshu chronograph the 23 and the 72 is the same movement there just with an hour counter but the first model the series one have like these really beautiful springs and then as soon as they realized that that was like a lot of work then they change it for for, for for these kind of uh punched out like metal springs that are just like a plate that is bended in different forms this is the approach that you see on many uh, watches because it's really it takes a lot of time to, to, to make these uh, springs because first they, they, they have to be cut out and then afterwards they have to be adjusted in, in thickness and hardened and tempered and, 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 and what have you. Where just with a wire spring, you just cut a piece of wire and bend it and then you're finished. That's another approach. Of course, for 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 cheaper watches, it makes total sense. You know, like this, it's, it doesn't make sense to, to, to make these kind of expensive uh, springs. But uh, for, for for the high end pieces, is is definitely make is, is springs, and it's also something that the collectors is uh, more and more aware of that there is these kind of differences. But that's where we have an advantage making smaller runs of watches that we can make a decision to to make better quality parts in certain cases, which are just impractical if you need to make a hundred thousand of them or half a million of them or whatever. Yes, of course, because if 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 you have to to to, to make like I don't know like a. Uh, Fifty or hundred thousand springs, you know, for for me to, to to make like ten or twenty of them or fifty, I don't know how many. Then that is like a feasible task. But if you have so so yeah. many, you you need like an army of people just to, just to make springs. Then then it doesn't make <laughs> a sense. Uh, yeah, Valju and then and Etta kind of pushed the limits and, and boundaries of what you can do with just a flat bent piece of of metal that's just stamped out and and made in in that manner. Over the last few episodes, John and I have been talking a lot about your watchmaking masterclass because it's something that I, I've been following along. And and I have to say thank you, first off, for making that course. It's uh, it's nice to see somebody actually doing the work. It's a lot of tasks that I know how to do because I've, I've been a machinist, but it's nice seeing somebody doing them specifically in regards to watchmaking and, and making new plates. So thank you for, for putting that out. But I, I have to ask, that was a couple of years ago when you released that, and you were sort of alluding to the fact that there was going to be a, a follow-up course. Have you, uh, have you been working on that follow-up course, or do you, do you think you're going to be releasing that? I know. I mean, when, when I made it, I, I had like a lot of time, and now time has become like a little bit more a limited resource. I have like a dream about making a, a, a course, and, uh, but just to give you an idea, like the Masterclass course took like three months to make. Uh, yeah. to, to to film, edit, and 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 all this, so it's, so it's like a huge task to to make these courses, and um, yeah. the I can see the market for this kind of course is very limited, sure. both like very few of them compared to the other courses I have, uh, so in that regard, it's kind of for for me, it's basically taking three months off unpaid to to to, to make like the like the next course, so that is like the main issue. Of, uh, of 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 doing it, uh, what what I have done is like I, I had some uh, some classes in in my workshop where I taught the techniques where people come uh, to, to to my workshop, um, in in first in, in in Switzerland and then also here in in, in Denmark, uh, and 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 that is kind of uh, maybe like for me like a better way to do it. Uh, where where I can where people can 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 travel here that that they learn the techniques and uh, and we have a good time with with with, with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I can appreciate. I, I've been doing a lot of video work lately and trying to trying to publish some some videos myself, and I I can appreciate just how much time and effort it it adds to to doing anything like that, and and then trying to create a a cohesive course is is challenging. So I I, I understand the the challenges of it. I do hope that you do it at some point. I know I've had a I've had a bunch of follow up from other people who've who've listened to a few of our episodes on you know where we've discussed it and a number of people have said that they they're really hoping that there there is one out there so I, I do know that there are fans out there who will uh, who will enjoy it one day if you uh, if you get around to doing it. No, but 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 it's definitely something that is uh, on on my list to do. But uh, at the moment, I'm uh, fully charged with. Uh, first of all, I didn't think we didn't touch about that, but we did like the restoration of this like uh, Jens Olsen clock that's been taking like a ton of time here the last year. I was I was, I was going to going to mention that. Yeah, we went off on another tangent. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that 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 was that was like a huge job, and then uh, the the next thing was just like to to settle here, like to move a whole uh, whole workshop or building a workshop, uh, building, uh, not building a house, but, you know, like setting in like a new environment and uh, building mm -hmm. a, or 
like 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 a new or how do you say like uh, getting new clients and 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 all this. Yeah. So it have been like an enormous uh, uh, an enormous task uh, to do. Well, how long have you been back in Denmark then? I've... Uh, now, now we we moved back in in Denmark in um, in July two thousand eighteen. Uh, so okay. it's like two two years now. Yeah, it, it is a lot of work setting up a new shop. I've been trying to do that myself, and it's it's very time consuming getting a new studio up and running. Yeah, definitely. And then there's like just small stuff that that you don't think about, like uh, that you that you have to have electricity and you, you, you know like cooling and water and what what have you for yeah. for, for for the machinery and, and and all this and each little step you think ah that's just like a half a day of work and it ends up taking <laughs> like a two to three days each time you have to do something and that's of course <laughs> so how many of the fifteen thousand plus components in jens olsen's world clock have you actually had your own hands on I mean, I basically have my hands on everything because I worked with it for four years when I was an apprentice. So it's mm. it's so I, I was like uh, helping with the maintenance and uh, and also like the general keep up of of, of this uh, extraordinary clock. Um, so here the the, the on, on this time with the servicing uh, of it because it's been like twenty years or twenty five can remember some something like like that since last time it was taken apart and and restored and now it was time again for it to to be serviced and uh, when when I started there was the plan that I have to do a lot of it but then there came like all the the corona covid uh, the, the mm. <laughs> disease and uh, since uh, a lot of my colleagues is uh, in in the age of re- retirement. The, we we kind of agreed upon that I didn't work so much in 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 that workshop because I had like a lot of exposure to people and have uh, children in in kindergarten and uh, so on. So that, that therefore it became like less work that is uh, first intended. But I don't know how many thousand parts I have in my hands out of fifteen thousand. <laughs> so it's a it's 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 such a like a totally insane project that they made at that that time. To build this uh, clock, that should be the the clocks of all clocks, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's really yeah, it's such a also like super inspirational to to see uh, first of all like the the mechanism is, is is one thing, and and the other thing is like like the, the design. I mean, they had like our architect to to make all the design of the components and the, and uh, and and everything uh, in, in in that regard. And uh, and and that is really like a study in uh, in in design and in proportion of the of the different pieces and so on. So that is something uh, I really find find interesting. Another interesting and insane mechanical object that I see you've been working on recently is your your Curta calculator. How is that process? I've I've been asked to work on one and I turned it down because I just finished some in depth work uh, restoring a, an automaton that took a lot longer and much more effort than, than I anticipated it would. And having not opened a Curta calculator before, I wasn't, wasn't willing yeah. to, to take it on <laughs> in, in the moment. Uh, but, but how was that process? And, and did you learn anything doing that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like, first of all, I just like the, the Curtis because they're like, first of all, it's like this extraordinary history that, about like mm-hmm. the maker who basically made it at, at, going, uh, at gunpoint in order to, to survive in, in one of these camps in the, in the Second World War. Uh, and then uh, second of all, it's like totally ahead of its time. I mean, the the design of it and all this is like, it mm-hmm. looks like uh, like a Nikon cameras from the 70s or something like this. And mm-hmm. it's made like in, in the end of the 40s. And uh, so, 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 so in that respect, I really uh, love the Curtis and then just the, the mechanics in, inside that you're able to do really, really come complex uh, mathematical operation with only me- mechanics. So in inside, like it's not so complicated. I mean, that's also. I mean, I worked a lot with complicated watches, so it might sound <laughs> not, maybe not the right one to to ask. But it's a uh, it's it's basically a repetition of the same mechanism. Mm. Uh, each number have like one mechanism, and it's repeated for each uh, number. And, uh, right. and 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 then then you have like a pinwheel in the middle uh, that then turns around, and then depending on how each mechanism is standing, you can make the calculations. So I must say it's really a well-built and it's really uh, fairly easy to, to, to service. The only, the only thing is that it's not so easy is that all of the screws and all the components is extremely tight fit. I mean, they really want to make sure nothing uh, came, came loose. 
Uh, so you really have to have like uh, super good screwdrivers and really good jacks for holding everything. Uh, or, or otherwise, there's a big risk of uh, of destroying some of the components. So, did you make your own jigs to work on the Kurda? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I made like a a, a really simple uh, kind of for where, where where you where you have like a, a leather back that is full of sand that you can can fold around the piece and then get mm-hmm. steady uh, like, like like that. So it's kind of for um, it supports the piece the whole way around. Nice. Yeah, I've always loved the Curta calculators, and I'm I'm always amazed that it was designed in an era without any CAD. And of course, if if he'd had CAD available to him, he would have had no reason to design this this calculator. So, it, but it's it's amazing that uh, that as you say, he made this and designed this in a in a concentration camp, and and uh, I'm I'm always shocked every time I see the inside of one of those and and see just how complex they are and. And how well they work for uh, for all those calculations. They're so compact too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But because I, I I have some uh, normal like the Ottner pinwheel calculators and and so on because I, I I really love also because my engineering background then become like a little bit of a master nerd. Uh, but I so 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 I really love this kind of uh, thing where you can calculate something just with mechanics. I mean, it's so fascinating. And uh, and and the curter is uh, made. Uh, it's it's not the same mechanism as in a normal pinwheel calculator, uh, but it's uh, it, it's kind kind of similar, and it's just like compressed so much in size. Uh, but when when you see it inside, it's really brilliant uh, layout. Uh, that uh, that instead of everything being aligned, then you put everything in a circle, and thereby you can also eliminate a, a lot of the parts that you will otherwise have to have. Uh, because you only need like one one before you had like one drum per per cipher, and uh, now you can have like one drum for all the ciphers because uh, the ciphers is lying around like one one drum. I don't know if it makes sense, but it's uh, mm-hmm. that, that that that's a really uh, an ingenious idea. Uh, so so I had quite a lot of different uh, calculators, and it just uh, <laughs> came to me over all the time. And one of the most crazy ones, it's like, it's, maybe it's going to make like a film about it just to show how insane it is. I have like one of these, uh, it's like a Swedish one. It's a facet. It's called like the ESA-0 uh, or dash one, I can't remember. But it's an electromechanical calculator. And it can do uh, uh, multiplication and division like automatically. And uh, it's just pure madness when, when when this machine is running <laughs> but it, you can probably look it up on youtube or i gonna make a little film about it and then you can can see it on my feeder yeah in terms of the the modern aesthetics of the curta calculator that typeface that they used on the the curtas to me seems like it's right out of a, a science fiction film yeah yeah every, yeah but that's uh but but that's the thing i mean it's totally it's a little bit like this uh what's called the an antiquitea thing that is just like mm-hmm. uh, a thousand years before there was supposed to be like a like a mechanical mechanism it just pops out there, there was something yeah and uh, and it's a little bit like this with the curta as well because it's the design wise uh, and also the mechanics inside the way it's manufactured it, it doesn't correspond with the time when it was at, when it was built yeah i'm quite taken by the elegance and, and dimensionality of hannah's hackanthera series of sculptural engravings have you, or has she, for that matter, given that she's also trained as a, a watchmaker, ever considered integrating elements of that style into, say, the hands of a watch? Yeah, of the hands of a watch, we haven't really, but the the balance bridge of the the, the, the watch we are we are making now, it's like mm. in, in inspired of, of 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 some of that. So yes, she's she's amazing in uh, in 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 design and this Akintura uh, uh, series that that she she's doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, what's called always impressed when I go into the workshop and something new uh, come, come, comes out. If it's a piece of jewelry, mm. a sculpture, or something like that, that is uh, is, is is always interesting. Yeah, I, I've been enjoying following her uh, one cubic millimeter project as well. I I've done a little bit of hand engraving, and I cannot get my head around just how <laughs> how good she is with a, a graver, and just how and not just how you know how accurate it is. But how good she is at sculpting! It's a, uh, it, it's remarkable. She's an incredibly talented woman, and we, we, it's not she isn't somebody we've talked about before on the show, and we should have. Um, we'll definitely make sure to link to uh, to her uh, two Instagram accounts because the the work that uh, that she's doing is remarkable. 
totally agree. I mean, I, I met her in uh, Vianney's workshop where she was making uh, dials uh, for, for him. So she was there mm-hmm. and, and, and the engraver is doing all the and, antique arts and, and, and all this. And, and since you have a, a background in uh, first in, in, in watchmaking and then uh, later in, uh, in she, she went to like uh, an art academy in Hanau in Germany. Uh, where she she studied like like engraving, and uh, mm-hmm. and then like the combination of the two both to be like really like understand technical parts. So so that is what makes really it's really great to to work with her because she she understands this immediately uh, when when, yeah. when when we're working on a project together and it's said like I have to be like this like that and the height and so on. That, that there's no need for for explanation and and everything. So that is. Uh, that is um, amazing to to have like a partner that is where we can work together, and uh, and create something uh, amazing out of that. Is she collaborating with you on this uh, this series of watches that you're working on? Like, is she going to be doing the dial work, or have you uh, have you figured that out? Yeah, ab- absolutely. She uh, she, she designs the, the the dial and uh, all the decoration and the movement, all the script and all this. That is uh, her doing that. Oh, that's great. So um, yeah. And uh, not touching the cubic millimeter project there, that is uh, that is uh, also <laughs> such an insane uh, <laughs> project. Yeah, I've I've, ex- I've explained it to a few people, and and they thought that I was talking about something that was a cubic centimeter, and then I and then I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. And I show them this <laughs> the photos that are on her Instagram feed, and it's just it is unbelievable seeing the and you know, hence Christian Anderson, who's the the subject of this this uh, bust. Uh, he has a very distinct nose mm. and a very distinct face, and she's done an amazing job of capturing his likeness in in this little uh, this little part. Uh, and that was actually like a story to that his his nose was really like a huge uh, problem to this because it, it is so big. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 she have he have she first sculpture you know like the whole face, ears, hair, everything perfect, but the nose was too too short. <laughs> and then the only way to make it longer is to take off more material. So basically remove his whole face, everything, and like, oh, no. like deeper. And we did that like like three times on, until it was <laughs> big and uh, long enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's remarkable. And uh, we, we, we we had like a, um, a producer from some TV stuff that was visiting us the other day, and she looked and, at it on microscope, and, and we, we, we were telling about it. And it's like, yeah, now you have to, to look. There's this small pin under the microscope, and there's like Hans Christian Anderson. And and then uh, when, when when she looked through the microscope, she she just jumped back from the microscope, like totally surprised, <laughs> like that there actually was uh, his face underneath there. <laughs> so that was uh, really, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> like how how do you and and Hannah find the the balance there with these two little kids running around the house, and you're both independent, forging your own careers? Like how do you how do you guys make that work? I mean, I think the secret to a lot of this, uh, especially independent watchmaking, is to organize your life in a way so you can. Because when when you build build a watch, uh, it in the beginning is it like the main thing is finance, you know, like because mm-hmm. you yeah. you have to when you build a watch, you basically have to finance one year to two years of work of un, unpaid mm-hmm. work before you can can do that. So I have like different in- income streams. I have a little bit for my webpage. It's not like a like a gold mine, but I have some some there. I do a lot of speaking uh, around in, in the world, right? And and then I have some restoration work. I I, I do it as well. Uh, so the work like balance, of course, is is so that we don't need to work. You know, like pulling twelve hours days uh, every day to 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 make this. So that, that therefore we have made also a priority to, of course, to to to, to have a good time with, with with our kids because otherwise we can spend like all the time in in the workshop uh, to, uh, to 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 come up with a project like this. That's also why it takes longer yeah. than it o- otherwise would. Of course, I've also chosen to start it up and show actually like from beginning. Uh, some some of the parts. Even also, I'm kind of further ahead than what you see on on, on Instagram because I, I I I kind of want to keep it uh, a, a, a little bit that I can develop things instead of just showing all the different steps in in the developing. I I kind of just want to make like the main touchdown like uh, uh, along along the way because just I made like five prototypes so far of of this watch. Mm, nice. Uh, in 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 order to 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 have it. Made you know before you 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 have like a function uh, main main plate that was like the biggest issue, 
to, mm-hmm. to, to, to make something that, that, that works there, you know, like just when, when you see it, it seems like pretty simple. Uh, there's just like a couple of cutouts on, on each side, <laughs> but, but the amount of work that, that goes in, 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 into that. It was so complicated. And uh, then you realize in your drawing that 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 jewel is like, I don't know, like a couple of hundreds to to one side or the other, and then it starts to stand and uh, and, uh, and 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 what's called wobble, and you can see it on mm-hmm. uh, afterwards on the on your line and in the vipograph that it, it can that is <laughs> that is not running correctly, and uh, all, all all these kind of small things that is uh, that is something that that really takes a lot of effort. Well, thank you very much. It's been a, a pleasure speaking with you, Christian. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure, and and again, thank you very much for what you've shared. It's been it's been challenging sometimes finding good information on how to do some of the work that we do, and and uh, it's appreciated that you're sharing some of your knowledge and getting it out there. As uh, we've we've mentioned before, Philippe Dufour, one of his uh, sayings that I really like is that graveyards are full of secrets, and it's it's nice to see somebody who's in his prime sharing some of what he knows, so that uh, it doesn't it doesn't get uh, lost. Yeah, thank thank you because that is one. That's something that is really on my mind. I mean, that is when 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 I had to learn this, it was so hard to get in information. It was first yeah. when I I met like uh, Vianney and especially the I, I don't, I cannot say that is uh, know him that 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 well. But if I took some uh, at, at at that time, we were a couple of uh, people going on in in his workshop and uh, and learning like. Uh, uh, Geneva stripes and uh, and, uh, and and doing like uh, baveling and, and 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 all this and and he was so kind to to, to share this kind of knowledge uh, with, mm. with, with with us that it kind of inspired me as as well you know it was always something that kept in my back of my mind that, that there's no need to hide all these uh, all these kind kind of skills there was also the poor who told me one one time because I, I kind of said like ah but you have to uh, uh, you know, like share some of your secrets, and he just looked at me and said, "That that that, that there is no secrets. They're just hard work. Yeah. Like just they, everything is described in the books. You can you can just read it. You know, like and 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 afterwards, you know, like now I I I work so so long uh, with, with this with this kind of job, and and I when I when I read, for example, just the Daniel's book, watchmaking. You know, like eighty percent of everything you will ever need is written in 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 that book. But at at the, at the time when when you're First time you, you 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 read it, it seems like something is uh, missing. You know, like you was like, hmm, that's kind 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 of weird. It's 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 in- interesting to see all all the step, but but you don't really see the bigger pictures. How to connect all all the dots uh, to, to together? That's something that that takes some some time to do it. And if if I can help uh, helping somebody else to to speed up that that process a little bit, I'm really glad to do that. Yeah, fun, funny enough, Chris actually mentioned to me the other day that that you for him have sort of filled in a lot of the missing pieces that were if missing for him from, from Daniel's book. So uh, you are certainly living out exactly what you're endeavoring to. Yeah, you're welcome. It was so, so nice to be here. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop. And Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at silver underscore hand.